again. Uh, I don't need it. Uh, well, I think a brief introduction is, is required, uh, and it will actually provide, hopefully, some uh, optimism for accomplishing the goal of uh, most people in this room. Well, I've been doing country risk analysis. In a few months, it'll be 40 years. I actually once had black hair. Uh, my very first job out of graduate school was I was offered to set up a sovereign risk unit country risk department at a small bank in North Carolina, NCNB. And when I went there to interview them, they were willing to take someone out of graduate school. They said, can you do it? And I said, yes. And the reason was I knew that the field didn't exist. So absolutely no one could say I was wrong. Uh, now, the implication of that, though, is uh, uh, important because nothing existed, no statistics existed. All the kinds of things we see today took decades to uh, see in practice. Uh, I'll give you one, one example to show you how crude everything was. Many countries, they wouldn't give you foreign debt numbers. You'd get some numbers of officially guaranteed debt from the World Bank, but it was a state secret in Mexico. You only got international reserves once a year on the 1st of September when the president of Mexico gave his equivalent of the State of the Union address. Think of what we now have today in terms of all these statistics that exist, but it took time and it took crisis after crisis to improve what statistics were being presented by governments. Now, in terms of uh, uh, rating agencies, and I will get to uh, a comment on the uh, Greek numbers uh, a little bit. Well, about a year ago or so, uh, Paul and Ian uh, did a good sales job on me. Uh, by convincing me that, in fact, uh, using net worth and using accounting practices uh, was a very valid way to uh, look at the numbers. And I, in fact, wrote a blog shortly after that uh, arguing uh, the point. Now, one of the reasons the problem was is that, you know, I'm by training an economist and a political scientist by, uh, through my studies, but I prefer to note that many people in here are accountants. But for we economists, I think society generally views us as the equivalent of medieval scholastic theologians. Why? Because everyone wants to hear what we have to say, but very few people understand a word we're talking about. So as an economist, uh, we, again, react very often in a theological uh, manner. But I had no trouble saying it was time to add accounting. Now, when I first was thinking about this, I thought, oh, goodness, it, this is actually a big break uh, from what we did uh, at Moody's, for instance. I was there for 15 years, uh, fortunately retired before this crisis began, uh, and have lived through every single financial crisis since the 70s um, in an intimate way, uh, another reason for gray hair. But uh, when, when uh, looking at these issues, it suddenly dawned on me, only in the last month or two when I was thinking about it and asked to talk, that it really isn't that big a leap from what we did in the Sovereign Risk Unit when I was there, and I, I, I'm sure it's probably similar today. I can't guarantee it, but quite similar. Most of the, uh, when, when I started out, when we were rating, uh, we always were rating governments, but in the Sovereign Risk Unit, we rated sub-sovereign governments outside the U.S., for instance, we rated the Australian states, Canadian provinces, and a number of other issuers. Well, in the case of Canada and in the case of Australia, as you already have heard, uh, they generally use uh, accounting principles. So here I, I was an analyst for Australia when I started out before becoming a managing director, and uh, we, we handled that. Uh, and in fact, I had to give presentations. We also rated the Supras, uh, you know, all the multilateral development banks. So we rated the World Bank, you know, the Inter-American Development Bank. And because I had no regulator, uh, you know, we used to go in. I, I did several presentations for the World Bank Board on what their balance sheet looked like. And I certainly wasn't an economist. I mean, I'm an economist, definitely not an accountant. But I had, we had the people in the, the department, and we made sure we hired them that had at least 
a minimal accounting background. Actually, some of them were quite good. And uh, we would work together on it. It really wasn't a big deal. But I hadn't really thought about that. It was just sort of, this is what we did. Uh, so to say that it would be difficult for the rating agencies to make the transition, I think would be uh, an overstatement. It's really, it's not a revolution. It would simply be an evolution that is similar to the evolution that we went from not having international reserves or debt numbers uh, to where we have everything. And so now we're gonna add one new layer on top of, uh, on top of that. So I'm, I'm optimistic. Uh, it's just gonna take time. It said 40 years to get where we are today in terms of sovereign debt analysis. And, and now you can get everything instantly from central banks. You can get the stuff online. And obviously they now have everything in, you know, at least all the headlines in English uh, and their, their native language. So I'm, I'm optimistic. If central banks and other institutions start to <clears throat> publish these more widely, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, they'll be used. Uh, we also recognized uh, Again, thinking about this, it wasn't the kind of thing you, I contemplated before, but uh, we, we knew that uh, the Australian numbers and definitely the numbers in New Zealand uh, and in Canada were by far the best at the time that we were looking at, because a lot of these countries, uh, when I was certainly looking at it, had, uh, other countries hadn't yet adopted uh, accounting principles. And we recognized that when uh, looking at you know, the ratings of those countries, but it wasn't ever specifically put into quote unquote models. Now I'm gonna give you an aside about models. And Fergus, you don't have to comment, except you probably say, oh no, 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 we don't do it that way. But you, if you take a look at the slides, they're excellent in terms of what all the rating agencies have as the models for sovereign risk. I guarantee you, they were only done because of regulation. I have helped set up some of those models in some rating agencies that are going to remain unnamed, nothing, definitely not Fergus, and uh, they're almost all the same, minor differences, minor differences, and the fact is, I'm going to be, again, uh, quite truthful in that. I've reached the stage in life where you can say what you really think, and who cares? Uh, you manipulated them. They can be manipulated with ease to get the result you think is right. It's so easy. I did it for years. Could do it now. So the regulators will be happy, uh, but it's meaningless. You're going to still come up. Why do all the agencies come up with extraordinarily similar ratings? It's just the way life is. Not the models. But keep the models. Keeps everyone who's regulating the rating agencies, which they didn't regulate them in the past, and there was no difference in the final, the final result. Uh, so the models, they'll work. Uh, what did we actually look at? Believe it or not, again, I'm thinking about this as hearing things during the conference. We had one of our senior analysts, she was obsessed with all the transparency uh, information in the IMF reports. Uh, a woman with decades of experience. So we, at the center of almost every rating conversation on a country, uh, we heard, heard her definitely comment on that. So it had an impact. Was it ever specifically cited? No. Uh, in fact, very often, the real discussions were not quoted because uh, at the time, and again, a lot of this has changed, I know, for regulatory reasons, uh, but what you did is, you came up with a conclusion, and for instance, we, we used to publish the numbers that the government produced, even if we knew they were wrong, because who wanted to argue with them? It was irrelevant, but it had no impact on the rating. We used our own numbers and our own, uh, you know, making adjustments to those numbers. But this is not only done uh, for sovereigns, it's done everywhere. For banking, for instance, uh, everyone knows you can have accounting forbearance. My goodness, you know, just look at the, you know, zombie companies in, in Japan, look at the Chinese banks were, and Japanese banks were insolvent for decades. I mean, everyone knew that. It doesn't mean you have a, a default or you have a, uh, a bank failure. Uh, so what did you do? All the banking analysts would come and uh, say, okay, uh, non-performing loans, and they would just, you know, say, oh, these numbers are completely off, and they, they'd probably say, oh, 50% of the balance sheet, whatever it was. So those adjustments would be made. And because of that, we looked at contingent liabilities. Again, we learned from crises. When you went in, took a look at the banks, for instance, in Southeast Asia, 
which was a problem because uh, I'll repeat, we were talking earlier yesterday and uh, what happened is the banking people said, you know, the Southeast Asian banks are in a mess. Uh, you know, not a single Southeast Asian country defaulted. Not one. Not one got debt relief. There was an East Asian crisis, but no default. And the ratings are supposed to speak to default. But in the end, uh, uh, things finally worked out. As another aside, after every crisis that the rating agencies have been uh, blamed for, they have become richer and more powerful. Every single one of them. Somebody else can study the reasons why. I have my own thoughts about it, but uh, it's true. Uh, I don't know if it's publicity or not, but there are a lot of issues regarding that. In terms of looking at Greece, <laughs> oh, governments have been lying to us for years. We knew it all the time. I give you one example, true example. Uh, I had met an investment banker who used to be the liaison with the rating agencies for the Spanish government. And he was smiling. And I said, oh, hello, you know, nice seeing you again, et cetera. He said, you know what my job really was? And I said, well, no, I knew you were the liaison. He says, no, it was to lie to the rating agencies. Total admission. Obviously, he was out of government, so he could say it. Uh, oh, God, we've been lied to by so many governments. I've been lied with, straight in the face. One uh, central bank governor said, we're not going to devalue. I go downstairs, out the door, the headlines on the newspaper, the government had just devalued. Not even a minute later. So I'm, when we looked at the Greek numbers, we always knew that they made no sense. Absolutely made no sense. Uh, we, we, in the old days, they used to leave out a large part of the uh, debt if it was related to military, but nothing wrong with that. We always accepted that. So yeah, it really was not anything that you ever trusted the Greek numbers, but we didn't trust most countries' numbers. Uh, but they've been, everyone has been getting better across the board. Uh, in terms of uh, the Greek debt to GDP, it's very funny. Debt to GDP was not the key number because what we were interested in mo far more was debt to revenue. Uh, not debt to GDP, because who cared if it was debt to GDP? We wanted, we wanted to know, for instance, if you had a, it, you get this odd feeling, and some people who are extremely conservative in their economic thinking were very furious to find out that mathematically, if a country had a large public sector and a high tax rate, they pose less of a risk than a country with a smaller government and a smaller tax base. Why? Because if there's a crisis and you're already paying 45% of GDP in taxes, well, to go to 50%, it's 5%, you know, not five, five percentage points there. He's talking one ninth. Well, if you're at 25% and you go up 5%, that means you're increasing at 25%. It's impossible to raise taxes to that rate. Or if you're cutting back government spending, there are massive decreases for small governments and minor decreases for big governments. Uh, again, people weren't always uh, pleased by that. So there are a lot, of, a lot of tricky things involved in all of this analysis. Uh, but in the end, what gave us, and again, I left before uh, the crisis in the Eurozone, and I've been calling for, for years now for it to either shrink uh, or fall apart. You may totally disagree, fair enough. Uh, because I don't think a monetary union can survive without massive transfers. Uh, can't, can't work. I did a quick calculation a year or so ago. Uh, every monetary union that's been successful over time has huge fiscal transfers, not loans, transfers. So I took a look at the Canadian system, which is around for many years, very successful, and I assumed Italy was the equivalent of Quebec. It's not the richest province, not the poorest province, but it's big in Canada. Well. The transfers as a percent of gross domestic output in Quebec, you then compare the transfers to that figure, and then you do the same, have that same percentage for Italy. Italy would have to get transfers of 30 billion euros a year in pure transfers from the European uh, uh, Eurozone uh, members. 
I don't think the Germans and the Finns are going to hand 30 billion euros in grants straight to the Italian government every year, but that's how Canada's monetary union works. Same is true in Australia, same was, was true and is still true in Germany, when, especially when the Deutsche Mark was more important than it is today. Uh, so I'm, I'm pessimistic. But regarding all these accounting uh, changes, they're fundamental, and what the rating agencies can do, rating agencies can't demand anything. But, as uh, people have mentioned, uh, if you're an issuer, and more likely having a, an investment bank as your ratings advisor, what you can do is you go and the rating agencies can start to ask, well, why aren't you using accrual accounting? And, and start to mention that the benefits when they're talking, talking about countries that are already using you know, better accounting. Be explicit. We used to take it into account. We were never explicit because no one cared. You know, no one really cared in those days. Uh, but today we could do that. It's really quite easy. And uh, the impact would be just by questioning, well, if you don't use it, why aren't you using it? And the word will go back. Do you want a better rating? Maybe we should provide better numbers. And you don't force anyone to do anything because rating agencies can't force you to do anything. You have to make it worth their while. Anyway, I don't want to gab on because I definitely could. Uh, full of anecdotes, but I won't bore you with them. Uh, but uh, uh, no, no, no. Uh, anyway, uh, thank you for your attention, and I look forward to hearing from my colleagues on the, uh, on the rest of the panel.